just turn to your neighbor and would you say, neighbor, I'm ready for the greatest miracle of my life. This is it. The time is now. The place is here. Right here in this vast tabernacle at World Harvest Church and hundreds of churches joining us live around the world in the great World Harvest Ministerial Alliance. Those of you watching at home and those of you on the great Daystar Network, could we welcome Daystar right now? I want you to be seated. I've got a word for you. I've got a word for you. I want you to allow me to share some words with you from the book God gave me recently entitled The Cross. One, it's a good time to talk about the cross, isn't it? I said the cross, one man, one tree, one Friday. Let's join together with the witnesses in the darkest day of human infamy and the ultimate triumph of heaven. All are being accomplished right now in front of our eyes by the selfless supreme sacrifice of God's only begotten Son. On that skull-shaped hill just outside the city gates of the capital of a troubled backwater province on the periphery of the vast Roman Empire. Those whose destinies placed them at this specific geographic location at this specific Friday perceive a lot of remarkable, astonishing, overwhelming things. On that day, human history will turn and eternity will be sealed forever three men are being executed executed in a manner that had been reserved for rome's worst criminals the earth cloaked now in the darkness that midnight itself would not recognize ears pick up the faint loathsome whistle and snap of the scourge the ring of the hammer on spike can be heard the wincing of the crowd at the horrifying shrieks of agony and the demonically fueled laughter of drunken, raucous soldiers. The witnesses stumble without their balance. The earth shakes and quivers beneath their feet as an earthquake rumbles down through the Judean hills in the air. The acrid scent of burning flesh wafts down into the valley below from the temple where a thousand Levitical priests make haste to sacrificially offer tens upon tens of thousands of innocent lambs before the last rays of sun are extinguished. And the day is done. It's an overwhelming scene, too, too incomprehensible. But so much infinitely more is going on just beyond the reach of the five senses, just beyond those senses in the realm of the spirit, in that invisible realm, the battle of the ages is reaching its climax. But as Jesus hangs impaled upon that cursed tree, we must look beyond the veil of the natural realm to glimpse the full reality of that ugly and mean and angry and biting beam. We must now follow the jeering and taunting and spitting and cursing throngs from Pilate's doorstep to Herod in Galilee and all the way back to Pilate's doorstep. Again, the round trip takes more than two and a half miles of walking through a gauntlet of unimaginable abuse. Jesus has not slept. His face is bruised and swollen from the beatings. His skin is now blistered and raw. Roman law dictates crucifixion must be overseen by a crucifixion specialist. The Carnifex Sererum, uh, the flesh nailer. 
As a precursor, Pilate orders that Jesus must be flogged. As we stand watching in stupefied horror in the crowd, the Son of God who spoke with such powerfully poetic words regarding how God would clothe the lilies of the field now in humiliation is stripped naked and bare. Soldiers stretch his arms around the curve of a massive stone column, stretch his skin taut. That cursive whip consists of strips of leather with stone beads and metal balls spaced along each strand. At the tip, a jagged fragment of sheep bone which has been filed as sharp as an eagle's talon. The wielder of that whip's an expert in his ghastly craft, of course, trained to elicit and inflict maximum pain but without killing his victim. As the flogging commences, it involves not only his back and his sides, but his legs are given due attention as well. Some of our fellow onlookers who have witnessed many floggings before begin to murmur, there's something different, there's something, there's something different about this one. Some unseen force seems to animate the man with the flogging whip he seems to be filled with unusual rage and vindictive joy. We begin to wonder as his flesh hangs round his legs if there will be anything left for the flesh nailer to work with at all. Finally, suddenly, it's all over. The volume of blood now pooled around the base of that column is astonishing. His piercing eyes are now swollen shut. His beard has been yanked out at the roots and the floggings have rendered Calvary's lamb essentially unrecognizable. He had been made sinless. Even as Moses placed a brass serpent up on a pole after he placed it in a fire placed that brass in a fire and your Bible says that he beat that brass to look like a serpent to free Israel from the serpent's fiery death so Jesus must now be beaten until he is unrecognizable into the shape of the very curse of sin which plagued the human race <laughs> but the worst yeah, the worst God, the worst, the worst is yet to come. One of the soldiers is handed a mocking purple robe and a crown of thorns, which is brutally jammed into his hemorrhaging brow, and the robe is thrown over his raw flesh upon his blood-soaked back. Then, another round of spitting and punching and taunting and kicking before the robe is ripped from his back reopening his wounds it's replaced by a splintery wooden cross beam which in his deplorable and depleted condition he must now carry in the sweltering heat of a Judean sun through the narrow cobblestone streets of, streets of Jerusalem he goes the insects the insects biting into his flesh flies swarm and hiss around him dogs howl in the background the lamb of God is being led to the place of slaughter but Jesus he's going into shock he halfway there he stumbles he crumbles under the weight and a black man rushes to his aid and although the black race has borne many a burden never one like Simon of Cyrene carried on the darkest day of devilish deeds finally we arrive at Calvary the crucifixion of a pair of common thieves is underway their screams are echoing down through the valley Jesus is stretched out on the cross beam with great precision a pair of five inch spikes find their marks in each wrist and are driven deeply into the wooden beam with the aid of ropes and pulleys the Son of God is raised up upon that pole. The crossbeam falls into its place with a jerk and both of his arms come.
them out of their shoulder sockets. There he hangs. But Roman centurion takes two more nails. With great power, he places one of the feet of Jesus on the side of that beam and he drives that spike through the thickest portion of Jesus' heel and then likewise on the other side, sideways through the thickest part of that heel. In other provinces, the Romans like to let their victims suffer. At times they would hang there for days until the fowls of the air pluck their eyes from their sockets to make the point you will not raise your voice against the Holy Roman Empire but in Palestine no such law applied for for the Jews one must be buried before the Sun goes down therefore in Palestine the executioner will simply break the legs of the victim causing them to be unable to raise up. And so, a Roman centurion with something that looks like a sledgehammer walks up to those thieves impaled on the crosses beside him with great precision, strike them in the femur bones. Now unable to raise themselves up from the cross, they'll die from asphyxiation in a matter of minutes. more angrily than ever any man ever approached a wooden beam the man wielding that sledgehammer approaches that cinder cross and just when he begins to swing he notices that Jesus chest no longer heaves up and down he's already gone a quick jab of a spear confirms it Jesus of Nazareth the Lamb of God, the Prince of Heaven, the King of Glory is gone. Certainly the living Christ proved his overwhelming love for us in his incarnation. He leaped out of eternity's majesty into an earthly manger born in a barn because that's where a lamb ought to be born. He trudged through the muck and the mire of this cursed planet so that you and I could be free. He proved it by his association. The religious folks of that day, they constantly, constantly were mocking him and they constantly were criticizing him for eating with all the wrong people. Why he let a common prostitute wash his feet. He did not shrink back from our repulsive evil he did not shy away from my malignant wickedness he ran he ran to embrace the disconnected and the disappointed the disillusioned and the disconnected fringes of society this is how he so loved us Prove that love without limitation by the crucifixion on that cross. But before his spirit left, he prayed for us. He took our polluted names upon his sanctified lips and prayed for us in that condition. After the beating of the skirt and the kicking he prayed for you he prayed that you would open your heart right now and say thank you thank you for dying thank you for bleeding Thank you for becoming the serpent upon a pole. Some look at the cross. <laughs> Some look at the cross and they're ashamed. Some are offended. But some of us, we look and we live. We look and we bow. 
and we say, wash me clean. Make me white as snow. Right now, open your heart and say, come in, Lord Jesus. I accept the price you paid. And tonight, I receive forgiveness in Christ as my Savior. Oh, the blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Could we stand together as Lisa begins to sing? Those of you watching across America right now, go to your phone. Go to your phone or log on at rodparsley.com. Get your prayer request to me. Say, pray for me to receive Jesus as Savior. As we worship right now, go to your phone, get that prayer request in. Those of you here, raise the anointing to the highest level of the evening. I'm on my way to the Calvary Memorial. We're going to receive Holy Communion on Good Friday. And we're going to pray. Oh, the blood of Jesus. 
家。